Hello and welcome to The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield, and this is a podcast about the deepest values of the people who shape our common life. Every episode, I speak to someone with some kind of public voice or platform and dig into the principles that drive them, how they think about their role and what they've learned about engaging across our many differences. In this episode, you'll hear a conversation I had with Jared Yates Sexton. Jared is an American author of short stories, a crime novel, and four non-fiction books about policy and history. He is the host of the Muckrake podcast, which provides progressive political analysis. We spoke about his childhood in a fundamentalist family, why he's more convinced than ever that there is a spiritual element to our many crises, and the problems with Marvel films. I really hope you enjoy listening. As usual, there's some reflections from me at the end. Jared, you have had your morning coffee. Uh, So I feel slightly less bad about pouncing on you with the kind of question that you don't get asked every day, which is about what is sacred to you. And maybe as a chance to let you have a little bit more of a warm up, because I know you're a writer and you care about words, how does that word land with you? How does it feel? Is it off-putting? Is it warm? Would you like to reject the whole premise? What's your initial experience of it? Well, you know what's funny about it is we're actually having this conversation at a really interesting point in my life. Um, I I, I have to tell you, when when we talked about having this conversation just around the word sacred, Um, I I wanted to like crawl into it like a womb and I just wanted to live in it for a little bit. Um, I, I have to tell you, I've been on a little bit of uh, a a personal journey of sorts and in so many different ways. And a lot of what I have done of recent times is I've really had to come to terms with a lot of my background, uh, with a lot of what I've gone through, a lot of the experience that I have had. Uh, and, and, and the word sacred to me, I have to be honest with you, Elizabeth, uh, it used to be uh, radioactive. It used to be a really frightening concept for me. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I think in the past, because of the background I come from and people who might not know me, I come from a really, really radical, evangelical, extreme background. Like when I was little, I was in, uh, and obviously we'll talk about this, but I was, I, w- I was exposed to some really noxious stuff. And, you know, I, I think, I think there are only a couple of ways to go with something like that. You either run from it and you get angry at it, or you stay within it and you sort of marinate in it. I ran away from it. And so for a very long time, the idea of anything being sacred was really terrifying to me and and angry making. You know what I mean? It felt like a really awful, ugly idea. Uh, and for reasons that, that we'll discuss. But I, I do have to tell you, as maybe it's that I'm getting older, maybe it's that I'm discovering more and more things to love and care about. And maybe it is that I'm finding um, an idea of self, right? The idea that there's something inside of me and there's something inside of you and there's something inside of listeners that is sacred, that is beautiful, that, that, that is important and even magical to a certain extent. So I, I, I guess I would go ahead and start the conversation by saying at this point in my life, as I'm, I'm coming into a new era in my life, I'm coming into a new place in my life, what I am discovering for myself is that what I find sacred is whatever it is that dwells, right? Like whatever it is, there's, there's obviously something within us that knows truth, it knows beauty, it knows inspiration, it knows courageousness, but also it identifies with someone else. And I'll go ahead and, and, and since you're trying to make me uncomfortable, I'll make you uncomfortable on the other side of this, which is, I, you know, you and I have now been on a call for, I don't know, six, seven minutes. I can already tell, and you know, I, I, I don't want to pull the curtain back too far, but uh, Dan was on here in a second ago, y'all are kind people. And, and, and I can already tell you're kind, good-hearted people. And, and you know how sometimes you meet people very quickly and you know that they're good people and you know that there's, a, there's an energy and a warmth radiating from them, that there's kindness and safety from them. That self-recognizing self to me is sacred. And it gives me hope. And I think that we're living in very strange, I, I, I would argue very dangerous times. But even though like I've, 
I think I've garnered maybe rightfully a little bit of a reputation as sort of a prophet of doom when it comes to politics and economics and, and, and structures. I remain incredibly hopeful. And the reason that I remain so hopeful and the reason that I remain optimistic is that because I do recognize that there is something sacred and beautiful between mm. not just individuals, but society as a whole. I think that there is something really, really important and immutable there that uh, I, I'm only starting now to really open myself up to. And, and because of that, I find it uh, I find it intoxicating. I find it wonderful. I find it uh, one of the most lovely things imaginable. Thank you so much. Yeah, I I often want to just, I don't actually frame sacred in a necessarily religious way, although some guests will really want to take it there. But because of the history of the way that words, that word's been used, I do always want to take just a little bit of extra care, particularly with people who've experienced religious trauma or who have kind of are bearing kind of scars of context in which the sacred's been used as a weapon. And I would say that can be in religious and, and non-religious contexts. But it is, it's a volatile word, right? It's a powerful word. And that can, that can, um, that can work in, in all directions. I do want to dig into a bit more of your childhood in as far as you yeah. are kind of comfortable talking about it, because particularly coming from a British perspective, and full disclosure, I am a Christian of the kind of British Anglican, very yeah. distant cousin, I think, but cousin of uh, <laughs> what you, what you grew up in. I can't, it's not, legitimate for me to distance myself entirely. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about maybe the kind of lived experience, the daily practice of it, of what your childhood felt like being brought up into in that very fundamentalist community. Well, you know, um, I, I, I want to say, and, and I'm more than happy to talk about it. I've, I've written about this because I, I, I think it's important to hear from people who have gone through this. I certainly needed it as a, as a child because, you know, depending upon the, the reality that you live within, it's almost impossible to imagine something outside of it, right? Unless you, you, you are exposed to it, unless somebody else uh, speaks to you. So I, I'm more than fine talking about it. And it's something I think that has defined me in a lot of different ways. It's defined the people that I love. It's defined my community. And quite frankly, I think it's changed, um, I, I, I think it's changed this nation, the United States of America, in a lot of different ways. And this is one of the reasons I actually, um, I, I, I think I was able to recognize some of the threats that this country was under early on was because it comes from the same circles that I was sort of born from. So I'm, I'm from, um, for people who might not be aware, I'm from a uh, Midwestern state called Indiana. I'm currently there right now waiting four to six inches and also 50 mile per hour winds. Uh, it is a beautiful state that has my heart, uh, but it is... Um, it's sometimes a rough place, right? Um, this is a state that has been um, sort of hollowed out. Uh, when free trade happened in the 1980s, then into the 1990s, um, you know, we, we lost a lot of our jobs. My people are factory workers. They're prison guards. They're miners. They're service workers. They're, 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 they're poor rural people. And because they're poor rural people. There is sometimes a fundamental worldview that maybe the world is unkind, maybe it is cruel. And as a result, you have to sort of harden yourself and you have to go out into the world, do what you're doing. You sacrifice your body to your labor. You and your family might not necessarily talk about things. You might not necessarily have, you know, big emotional conversations outside of outbursts and stuff like that. Um, the religion that we were in was reflective of that and probably instructive of that. Uh, it was, you know, I grew up in a family. I had a, a grandmother. I, I wrote about her in uh, The Midnight Kingdom a little bit as a, as a framing mechanism. I had this, you know, little sweet grandma, weighed no more than maybe 70 pounds, tiny, tiny little woman who was so sweet and so loving at times, but also was absolutely convinced that the apocalypse was around every corner. Um, that not only was the world on the precipice of ending, but that every single day you were doing literal battle with the supernatural devil. And we're not just talking about a trickster. We're talking about the most evil being that you could ever imagine. We're talking about, um, we're talking about, you know, possession. We're talking about, you know, just really, really evil things happening every single day. We were taught as children, what to do if the literal devil appeared in the room with us, because it was a spiritual warfare. 
And not only was what, that What do you do if the literal devil appears you in the room? You Elizabeth, I'm so, glad, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I've mentioned that in certain interviews before and people just go right past it, right? Because I, and, and I, I can talk about this for a while. No, what you do immediately is, is you, you bring up Christ um, you you affirm your own sort of beliefs. And if necessary, and this was the case in my childhood homes, there's a crucifix in every single room that's not just there to bless the room, it's there as a weapon. It's it's the literal like equivalent of there being a gun out on a table. So you can snatch off the wall a crucifix in case you need to do battle with a literal demon. Whoa. So... That wasn't just like my grandmother's thing, because my grandmother was an incredible chef. She would bring together elements of every religion possible and like bring them together and synthesize them, right? She was on the lookout for all of this. And and I have to tell you, like, we're it was really, really frightening, you know? And then you would go into church and we would go in from everything from Pentecostal to our, our main sort of branch was like very, very fundamentalist Baptist. And every single sermon uh, was from the book of Revelation. Like it never possibly ever Hmm. moved beyond apocalyptic battle. And so basically what you're seeing now in the United States was reflected back then in the 1980s, 1990s, which was Satan is not only real, but Satan is attacking the world. And Satan is, uh, there's, every plot is, is being carried out by politicians, by the wealthy, by the powerful. These giant conspiracies are being carried out. And so basically, every single moment of your day, and it's not just the idea of like a literal embodiment of evil showing up, it's the culture, right? It's what movies are being released. It's what music is out there. Your friends could very well be agents of evil. You know, they could be trying to tempt you into sin in order to take your soul. It was, it was a a, a literal living nightmare is, is the only way that I could put it out there with, uh, not just nationalism, but also elements of white patriarchal supremacy, you name it. It was a, it was a really bad environment and it was always tinged with the, you know, I, I, I think for some people, they can have conversations about religion where they discuss elements of it, their doubts, elements of faith. That was never on the board. If you brought this up, if you talked about it, you faced almost instant excommunication from your family, which you know would mean economic and personal ruin. A really bad environment, like a really, really bad environment. And so for me, when I, for the longest time, when I thought of the idea of religion, and again, sacred, Right. When I when when I heard those elements, it was always almost a lure. You know what I mean? Trying to walk you into a trap in order to sort of bring you into a worldview of, of sort of power and oppression. I'm I'm healing from that, which um, I, I, I do have to tell you, I think that that is one of the most wonderful things that's ever happened to me is the ability to start to move beyond that and start to start to look for elements of community and elements of sacredness and elements of beauty because I, I as, as a podcaster and as a researcher I've been reaching out to you know people within the faith and what I keep finding is people saying hey it's not like that everywhere you know what I mean like we you can have these things you can actually take you know we, we can get into the the idea of what Christianity is or what it's supposed to be and it absolutely has been co-opted for powerful purposes and exploitative purposes. And there is a crisis and a schism within religion, obviously. There always is. But my ability to sort of start to look at that past and to start to recognize what it was, what it wasn't, and what it could be and what it should be, um, that has been, for me, it's been revolutionary. How did you... Were you excommunicated? How did you exit and I realize even as I ask that I can't help but be a painful story well it's you know it is and it isn't I'll I'll be honest with you I'm I'm a I'm a really weird guy in my family and in my community um and I always was I mean I wrote a book about this a little bit um the the man they wanted me to be I, I wrote about how you know I grew up in like a very traditional patriarchal framework, right? Men are supposed to be hard. Men are not supposed to feel. Men are supposed to just sort of 
uh, not really communicate, right? They're, they're bodies to basically throw at labor and then, you know, they're the king of the household or however we want to put it. I was always different. Uh, I don't know what it is about me. I'm still trying to figure that out. I was always very curious. I wanted to talk about emotions. I wanted to learn. Um, you know, it, it was it was a very interesting thing for me. And from a young age, you know, it, it was like the religious aspect of it. I was interested in the theory of it. I was interested in the 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 sort of the 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 minutia behind religion, right? Like I was I was the one that like as we talked about creation and Genesis. I wanted to know where God came from. You know, I wanted to know the story behind the story. I wanted to talk about the idea of omnipresence. What is that? Um, what is, you know, how, how do all of these elements work? And when I started asking those questions, I, I have to be honest with you, and this is uh, a defining element, I think, of my character even now and what I do and what I write about. If people don't like the question that I'm asking, that makes me want to know the answer more. Because obviously there's something there that needs interrogated. There's something there that needs dealt with. It it actually only sort of feeds my appetite for the question. So I was I was asking questions constantly. Um, by the age of I want to say it was seven, uh, my family like and my family again was evangelical Christian. They were reaching out to Catholic priests, being like, "Is there something wrong with this child? He's asking too many questions." And I, I, what happened to me actually um, is I, I want to say it sounds salacious, but also it's all too common because of the corruption of religion and faith. Um, we had a very charismatic preacher, uh, just an incredible performer and, and, and just like galvanized our church. And like I, I wanted to be him. I, I wanted to like grow up and like I would talk to him and I would talk about like, how do I follow in your footsteps? How do I do this thing? Um, it's kind of ironic. I ended up as a professor for a while because these are elements of the same sort of idea. Um, but you know, like a lot of charismatics, um, and a lot of people who, uh, I think sort of enjoy those performances. Um, he went down a road of scandal. Uh, there was a major, major, um, issue at our church. I'll just say that, uh, where he had to make a quick exit and that sort of, for me, was the moment of clarity to start questioning the elements and structures of power. Um, and then as I got older, I was able to talk to other people, almost like a shibboleth, you know? Like, I was able to talk to other members of, of these churches who had gone through similar things, and we were able to form our own community. Um, but no, I wasn't excommunicated, but I do not know if my family knows exactly what to do with me. And I'm not sure that they always have. I've always felt a little, um, I've always felt a little orphaned at every community. I, I, I don't necessarily feel completely comfortable at home. I was in the academic world for forever. I never felt particularly comfortable there as a working class person. And, you know, I work in politics and history and all of these things. And I, I've never felt particularly comfortable in any of these communities. Yeah. Sometimes that's, what we need in order to be able to see things and narrate them, I fear. Um, this is going to sound, and again, this sounds super British, but I always feel more private than asking about someone's sex life, which is to go even more vulnerable, which is about the was it, which is about the God question or the yeah. divine question, not just the structures, not just the religions. Did you have a sense of belief in God that you lost? Did you never have one? Do you still have one? All of that language is complicated and questionable anyway. But if you're willing to just dig that tiny bit more, I'd love to hear about that. My relationship with God, um, I have to be honest with you, the more that I think about it and the more that I deal with it, I feel like my original relationship with God was a patriarchal father relationship, which of course is you know the communication that a lot of these churches have because they create patriarchal structures of power. If a man created the universe, then men need to be uh, you know obeyed and that's the power structure. And of course, um, the the Christian mythology is is wrought through with the idea that women are weak and that women are the ones who have caused the problems that you know humanity suffers and as a result we have patriarchal structures of power. So I believe if you were to trace my relationship with God, I think for a very long time, I had a father-son relationship with God. And as a result, like all fathers, you reach a point where you realize that your father is not perfect. And you realize that your father is not necessarily uh, fair. 
And eventually, at some point, they lose, like, you know, the, the scales fall from your eyes. And you start to question, well, you know, the, the question of suffering. And, and, you know, for me, it was one of those things where it's like, if, if God is in control of all this, he obviously hates my family. Because the suffering that my family is undergoing is just like not even like in the realm of fair. But I will tell you, as, as I've gotten older and now, I, I, I have to be honest with you, and, and maybe this is deeper in the weeds than, than even this question wanted to get into, but I'll go ahead and do it. I think a large part of the problem in our world, I think a large part of the reason why we're going through the myriad crises that we are is because systems of power and systems of exploitation have so affected us and so traumatized us and so changed us that we have come to believe that we are essentially sort of soulless automatons who go out and buy things and work, and then that's it. And not only that, but we can't trust one another. That everybody's trying to get one over on us, and everybody is our enemy. And that includes our families. You know, uh, I, I listen, I, I, I want to go ahead and I want to put my marker down and make it very clear before I say what I'm about to say. I am a leftist. That's, I want to make that clear. But what I'm about to say will sound conservative to some people. And I think it's important that we talk about these things. I do think that there is a loss of meaning. I do think that there is a loss of bonds. I do think that there are things that have been whittled away and poisoned and destroyed. And by the way, in my research from what I've done for this book, I have to tell you that wasn't unintentional. A lot of it was very, very specifically done in order to create new structures and to, to make us do certain things. But I have come, as I've come to realize the problem, that, that atomization, you know, that, that idea that we are all out to get one another, this distrust, this idea that we, we can't have bonds because you and I, you might be trying to get something that I have and I might be trying to get something that you have. I have come to a better understanding. And this goes back to that idea of self, that idea of sacred. What we do have to rediscover is spiritual. And when I say, and, and spiritual is almost more loaded than the idea of sacred, right? There has to be a rediscovery of something that is larger than me trying to make my money and you trying to make your money and my property and your property. And what I have found is this. My idea of God has evolved to what I think now is what the original idea of God was before all of these things were co-opted, before all of these things were perverted, which is, I am connected to you. You are me. I am you. We're all living separate lives, but deep down on some level that a microscope can't get to, there is something that connects me to you. That is so helpful. Thank you. And I think we'll come back to it in relation to kind of power and where we are with political crisis. But I just want to fill in a little bit of your story. So you are now known as a kind of political theorist, political commentator, but originally you were a fiction writer and a short story yep. writer. So tell me what drew you to that? What what was the thread you were pulling on as you were trying to tell stories and, and kind of carve out space in that world? Well, so I've always been interested in politics, and it goes back to when I was a child. Um, I always wanted to know the story behind the story, and I I wanted to know, like, the secret histories of things. And it turns out there's secret histories to everything, which, you know, makes it fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I, I started out with my trade as a uh, fiction writer. I, I've always been into fiction. I've always enjoyed it. I still write fiction. But then in uh, 2015, 2016, I had this failed novel. I mean, it was such a mess. Um, it, 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 I believe that when I left it, it was up to 540 pages, and it was not ready to end. Uh, it, it was a, a big, giant, just shambling Frankenstein's monster of a mess. And I was just like, I have to stop. But it, it was it, it just ended up being a dead end. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna follow the 2016 presidential election. I like a lot of other people thought it was going to be boring. I thought it was going to be an absolute snooze fest. It was going to end up being Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton. And I just wanted to like, I was going to go out and write some essays about it and just basically, you know, shuffle around. Uh, what happened was 
I was one of the first people to go into like Donald Trump's rallies and talk to the people. And what I discovered very, very quickly talking to the people at Donald Trump's rallies is that people like my family, people who had been very angry for a very long time and stewing in these conspiracy theories, that they had not only come to accept Donald Trump, but that they had sort of, it wasn't about him. I want to make that very clear. Whenever Trump gets brought up, he sucks up all of the oxygen in the room. He's a symptom of a larger disease. That problem became very obvious to me very, very quickly. And because I was like one of the first people to go in these rallies and understand the, the gathering threat, I quickly went viral, which is a modern condition. And I was sort of thrown into the deep end of the pool. And the next thing I know, I suddenly have a platform. People want to know what I have to say about things. Neo-Nazis are showing up at my house. Like it was, it was a wild thing that even now, six years removed from it, um, it still seems like a fever dream. Hmm. So it wasn't so much, I'm done with writing stories. I need to write politics. It was, sounds like it was much more accidental than that. Do you, do, as you were, as, as you were transitioning and going from having this kind of voice in the platform as someone who wrote stories to having a voice in a platform as someone who was being much more direct about how the world is and maybe how we, how it should be, did it feel like a vocational shift? Did you feel a sense of growing responsibility as that platform grew? Yeah, uh, to be honest, and it's always weird to talk about this, um, so I, I hope that you and your audience can uh, have a little bit of patience and grace with me because it's a very odd thing that I have to talk about in therapy quite often. Um, I, you know, it, it was, it's one of those things. We're now six years down the road from me getting thrown into that deep end of the pool. Um, I always just want to be a fiction writer. That's I and, and I'm a really good fiction writer and I've got so many good ideas and I have so many things that I would much rather be doing. But in 2016, when I realized this, I suddenly realized that I felt a calling. I understood this stuff in a way that obviously other people either didn't or they were unwilling to. You know what I mean? There's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the journalists and a lot of the writers out there, they come from places of privilege. And as a result, they don't have, maybe they don't have the antenna that I do when it comes to these things or these communities. And as, a, or maybe they don't want to take a look at their own privilege and their own things that, you know, are tied into the crisis that we're facing. But I suddenly realized in the middle of this thing, and I'll never forget it, I went, I did a radio interview. And um, a white supremacist tried to break into my home. And I was in the parking lot dealing with the aftermath of that. And I just had a moment where like a, a switch flipped. And the switch flipped and I was like, I'm doing this. I have to do this. I, if I don't, I'm going to spend the rest of my life feeling bad about it. This is this for at least the next few years is going to have to be the, the vocation shift. I am going to have to go with this thing and try and do my part in it because it is a struggle. It is a fight. Um, you know, I assume some of your listeners and I have different political ideas, but you have to understand that there is a problem and that there is a crisis. And I, I think that all of us, I think in the future, we have to look at what has happened and where things are going. And at some point or another, when you're going to sleep at night in the deep, deep dark of the night, you have to think to yourself, what did I do? And there are so many different things to do. And I, I felt personally responsible for my role in it. And, and that's, uh, that's something I'm still sort of wrestling with. Yeah. And you're the kind of, and I confess I haven't read everything that you have written, but from what I have read and listened to, the thread seems to be very, um, a very strong central theme about this rising uh, threat of authoritarian forms of power, of fascism, essentially, um, that uses particular myths and stories, often drawing on religious myths and stories, <coughs> excuse me, in a way that is fundamentally destabilizing our, our societies. And you, sometimes when you talk, you're understandably very angry, and there is a strong sense of kind of them, you know, the guys with the power, often the actual guys. Um, but then there's also a strong sense of wanting to empathize with the people swept up in it, with the people like your family, with the people who um, you met at those Trump rallies. And I'd love to hear a bit 
so, something about that bit that what what yeah. is it within us as human beings that can tempt us or can um draw out the worst parts of ourselves politically what what do you see in people the kind of most the kindest interpretation yeah and and i'm so glad you asked that um i i, I take a lot of flack for that because i think um I think one of the hardest things in the world right really? now. Yeah, it, it really makes people angry sometimes. And I think it really makes people angry because it is much easier to believe that the people on the other side of the line are evil. And I mean capital E, evil. That there's something that is fundamentally wrong with them. You know, that, and, and you know, it's, it's, it goes back to the, the idea of original sin or the idea that there's something that is wretched and ugly about people. And, and, and basically that the baseline level for people is evil, right? Like we are wicked, self-interested, self-dealing people. And unless we transcend that, and there is an American ethos in that that is part of the problem. And I assume it's, you know, in Western civilization writ large, which is some people are capable, right? Some people make themselves better. Some people have made themselves better. And there is also, um, to go back to the idea of like um, uh, capitalistic ideas sort of corrupting us a little bit, there's also an advertising of that, which is here are my principles. I'm a good person. You should trust me. I'm the type of person who deserves success or I'm the type of person who deserves this. Um, but when it really boils down to, and, and this is important, authoritarianism, fascism, Nazism, whatever name we want to give it, it is not a phenomenon that just took place in the early to middle 20th century in Western Europe. This was not just something that just popped up out of nowhere. And it wasn't just a, a really charismatic leader who gave some incredible speeches, right? And just hypnotized everybody. And he was imbued with some sort of evil secret power that infected everybody. Humans, by nature, they, they can be courageous, but they can also be terrified. And, you know, there are reasons right now to be terrified. There are reasons to be angry. There are reasons to be frightened about the future. The systems that we were, and, and, and listen, I'll, I'll lay it on the line. I'm 41 years old, which means that I grew up in the 1980s and the 1990s. America was the superpower of the world. Nothing was ever going to change. It's not like anything happened in England like that, you know, and, and suddenly things have started to shift and you're starting to be like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I was born a little too late. Maybe I missed something, right? And as these things happen, people need explanations. And in America, for instance, we are raised in, in a steady diet of, well, used to be American exceptionalism. And that is religious. The idea is that God or the universe or fate or history has chosen the United States of America as its author and as its champion. And as a result, there's a reason why life is so good here and why life will always be good and why there's an opportunity for your life to get better if you work hard, if you put your head down, you move forward. Well, all those things are stories and parts of them are very, very strong lies. And when you have those stories and those mythologies at the heart of what you do, when things start getting a little bit rough, when your job goes away, when your family isn't getting ahead anymore, when your, your lifespan is shortening, when all of a sudden uh, the economy isn't good, when all of a sudden your politics don't make sense, when the events of the world don't make sense, you have a problem and you need it explained to you in some way, shape or form. But what do they do? They go ahead and they listen to people who tell them stories about why this happened. And it just so happens that those stories tap into prejudices. They tap into experiences that they've had. It stokes anger, but it also tells them something else. The problem's not you. You don't have to do anything except for give money over here, buy these products, arm yourselves with weapons, and protect yourselves from the people who are out to get you. Those stories are incredibly compelling. But they're especially compelling for another reason. Nobody is telling another story. There's no other story about how all this has happened. Most of the politicians, and this is true in the United States, this is true in Great Britain, the politicians who should be offering alternative explanations, they don't want to talk about it. They have no desire whatsoever to talk about why the systems aren't working because they are so intrinsically tied to the systems. Um, you know, in America, Republicans are telling a story about evil conspiracies. 
right? And by the way, like anti-Semitic conspiracies, they're talking about, you know, evil satanic cabals. The Democrats are like, hey, everything's fine. There's no problem. Why is everybody so upset? Things aren't fine. It, of course, the conservatives in, in Great Britain are basically carrying out austerity and, and just sort of smiling and making fools out of themselves. Labor, meanwhile, has nothing. There's no real alternative explanation in any of this stuff. And as a result, you have people who are going to ping between the different things. It ends up being an educational, uh, rural, urban divide. It ends up becoming a cultural war as opposed to a conversation about what is happening and where we're going. So I feel very bad for the people who have been taken in by this, who have been built by this. I think that they can heal. I think that they can do better. There are some people you're not going to reach, but I do not believe that people are evil. I believe that there are people who are engaging in things we could consider uh, unhealthy, bad, evil if you want. I think there's a lot of manipulation that's happening, but no, I, I do not believe that people, that their natural default setting is evil. This is a really unfair question to ask because I do think people have different gifts and your kind of position as a kind of analyst, a sort of prophet in the wilderness, um, a critic of the current political order is an entirely legitimate one. But I did want to ask, and it was just coming through right at the end of Midnight Kingdom, like little seeds of it, what, what your positive vision is, what your political philosophy is, what... And I'm not saying you have to know how to get there. No one does. But what would you love to see as our kind of political settlement if it's definitely not this fascist-leaning conspiracy theories? Well, I think there's a lot to that, obviously. Um, you know, I, I on one hand, I'm always very cognizant that you can't answer, let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. You know what I mean? That, that we can't just all of a sudden, like, I mean wake up one day. <laughs> yeah, and I wish that was true. But I will say... With us, I think it starts, honestly, with conversations like we're having. You and I are engaging in intimacy right now. I don't know you, but I like you very much. And I already feel very comfortable talking to you and having these conversations. And by the way, I think podcasts are an, an, an incredible uh, example of these things, which is if we're not just engaging in sound bites, and I have to imagine that you and I, if we were to get into political ideas and policy, we have different ideas. I guarantee it, right? But right now, we're talking about individuals. We're talking about feelings. We're talking about backgrounds. Now, all of a sudden, you and I could probably have policy discussions, and I understand that you're a true broker. I understand that you would be coming from a place not where you're trying to screw me over, but where you're trying to come to something, right? You're trying to find some sort of an answer, some sort of a thing. That feeling is not only powerful, it's addictive, it's a much better way to experience the world than the default setting of looking around every corner and literally thinking everyone's trying to steal your kids or trying to steal your stuff. On the individual level, we have to remember that we're not just consumers, that we're not just watching politics unfold on a screen. We have been taught that basically politics is American Idol, right? You, you, you watch and then you vote and then you watch and then you vote and you just go and you go and you go. We have to learn that democracy is participatory, that it, sh it has to be something that we engage in constantly. We have, to, we, have to, we have to meet our neighbors again. We have to solidify things, not necessarily with families, but also like the people around us, the community. We have to talk to our coworkers. The, the regime of austerity that neoliberalism has put into place has made us all miserable. It's time that we all talked about that misery and what is possible and what can change. And everybody now looks at how politics works. It's top down. It feels so large. The machine and the system is so powerful. It's beyond our reach. That's by design. But it can be changed. What has been shown over the past few years, even if we're talking about Trumpism, which was faux populism, it's that when large numbers of people come together, they can still affect politics. The Republican Party didn't want Trump until they had to have Trump. Right. They, they pushed against them. They thought he was great for fundraising. They thought he was, you know, he got ratings on the on the on the uh, debates and then someone serious would take over. No, the people came around Trump and they made that happen. Same thing with like something like a Brexit. Right. That was something that was 
you know, a political manipulation, but it was done in order to stoke the fires of faux populism. It turns out when people remember that they have power together, that things can shift. It's going to take it's going to take a spiritual reawakening. It's going to take a movement that I think is already there. I think is already starting to happen. You have people who have no understanding necessarily of history or organizing. They are holding up Amazon and Starbucks and Apple. They are literally beating the, the most historically huge corporations in the history of the world. And they are they are just mounting up victory after victory after victory against these people. There is an energy that is present. We forget it. And I think what has to happen is a rediscovery of who we are and what we are capable of and what our relationships and what I what we refer to on the left as solidarity. When you realize that that intimacy and trust can grow, you start to realize that, oh, all of a sudden those structures that seem immovable, they are very, very movable and they are very changeable. And so I think that's, that's I think, an entry point to my philosophy of why I'm hopeful at the moment. That's so helpful. And... Um, you basically said, what is the methodology behind this podcast at one point, which is if you, if I start with someone's positions, look, if I'd said, hi, Jared, you tell me, uh, why fascism is bad. Yep. Hopefully not everyone would disagree with you, but you know, tell me your main position. If I speak to my conservative guests and say like, lay out why you're conservative, lay out why you're gender critical, lay out whatever it is. Uh, then everyone switches off immediately and shuts down yep. who doesn't already feel connected to that position. Whereas if you start with someone's deeper values and their childhood and their story and you let them come into focus as a whole human person who is complicated <laughs> and fragile and um, longing and lonely and you know egotistical and all these things that we all are, and then you get to, and this is my vision of a good life, so much easier to hear it. Even if we still don't agree with them, you can go, okay, yeah, that sort of makes sense. Or I can sort of see how you got there. And then you're right. There's a, I love that phrase, a good broker. You can then have a good faith conversation. You can then start from human to human. We disagree on these things rather than tribe to tribe, you know, enemy to enemy, which is what we s let ourselves slip into so, so easily. Well, and, we and our politics prioritizes that. Uh, you know, the top-down structures of the party structure is absolutely, because, and, and to go ahead and lay my full cards on the table, I'm not, I'm not a Democrat. I do not trust the Democratic Party. Um, the Democratic Party is an expression of a very certain type of wealth and power in the United States of America. And it happens to be an expression of, oh, we mean well. We're so sorry that these things hurt, but I promise you that we're not racist or sexist or transphobic or whatever, right? They'll say the social capital part of it out loud, but meanwhile, they're like, I'm, we have to cut so many jobs and you just can't have health care and my apologies. I, I'm not aligned with that party, but what I do want to point out is that the party system and the structures of power they have been co-opted and corrupted by wealth. I mean, they were designed that way. Sometimes democracy sort of changes them. Occasionally there is a shift in power and who they represent and how they represent them. You and I, I I'm sorry, Elizabeth, I'm, uh, if, this is, if, if, if I'm wrong in this assumption, I have to assume that you don't have enough wealth to have your own private space program right? That you aren't considering buying Twitter this morning and, and, and being able to use it for whatever you want, right? You and I, I think, can be honest brokers with one another because I, I, I think we also have an understanding about top-down power structures, right? We do understand that we are living within a world that has been defined beyond our purview, right? We live with laws and trends and even algorithms that we didn't create and that we don't necessarily always benefit from. So you and I can have an honest broker conversation. The problem is that we can't go looking for that with the people who created those algorithms and who do benefit from that top-down power structure. And when you start having that conversation, all of a sudden you're not talking Biden-Trump, right? All of a sudden you're talking, hey, we are really honestly on the same side of a different schism. And when you start doing that, all of these traditional political paradigms that we all feel trapped in, I always call them uh, trenches, right? They're, you know, like World War I trenches where there's no movement one way or another. You couldn't possibly gain ground. You couldn't possibly lose ground. Those trenches, they evaporate. 
You know what I mean? And it's the same thing as engaging in intimacy with somebody who maybe you had a grudge with. Maybe there was some sort of a perceived slight. I mean, think about how families fall apart, right? Somebody says something, somebody does something, both sides think that they know what happened, but they never talk about it. And then what do they do? They clear the air and suddenly they realize, oh my God, we could live better. And in this situation, I think that that, that intimacy, that trust, that, that honest brokership, as you were saying, I think that is the key. And I think that if we can get to that point, if we can start to gain critical mass with that, and that's what's happened in the past. That's how revolutions occur, is you suddenly start to realize, oh, the old ways that I thought that we were living were reality, but it turns out all along those were imaginary, you know, like illusions and boundaries. And I, I think that, that that's how it has to yeah. start. Yeah. It's making me think about how, uh, all the way through reading and writing, I was... The, the ways religious stories get used so differently, right? That they can, Christian stories and the stories of your childhood can be used to exclude and to create kind of conspiracy theories and in-group and out-group dynamics or the Christian reconciliation tradition, you know, the nonviolent peace building tradition that motivates me so much, which is basically love your enemy, <laughs> like yeah. love your neighbor, seek moments of intimacy, like commit to the process even when it's hard, like take the slap on the cheek, <laughs> you know, turn your other cheek. Uh, it's such a, that we're, we can't get out from under our need for stories and for kind of organizing narratives. Um, I want to end on one question, which is going to seem frivolous. And I really didn't want to ask you it because full disclosure, I use Marvel films to relax. As sure. does, I'll have you know, a former de- guest, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, when I asked him how he relaxes, he said fish and chips and a Marvel film. But I gather that you have some concerns with Marvel films and I'm going to make myself listen to them (laughs) as a responsible citizen. Well, I okay, so here's the thing. I enjoy Marvel films as well. I mean, they're great spectacles. But <laughs> I, I also it. and and listen, this is I'm I'm actually really glad you brought this up because I think that this is pertinent to the conversation. Marvel films are mythology. They just are. They they they're the creation of new mythologies uh, in front of us. Big stories. And by the way, I always say this, like professional wrestling is the same thing. You know, it's like any time that you have large scale storytelling, what you're doing is you're creating and carrying out mythologies because human beings in art, in culture, are always expressing their beliefs about how the universe works. And then they're absorbing those beliefs and then expressing them and going forward. So, for instance, I enjoy Marvel films as well. But it's also important to point out why they are happening, when they're happening, and what it is that they're saying right? The Marvel films are an incredible mythology of the old order. And here's the reason why. Think about what the Avengers are. They're a group of incredibly talented, powerful individuals who are out there in the world where you can't see them. They're taking care of the problems. There are, there's a lot of evil, sinister powers in the world, almost like the devil, right? There is an energy that is evil in the world. There's a group out there taking care of it. Look at the look at the group. I, people roll their eyes, but I you cannot avoid this. It's Captain America, the embodiment of the United States of America. It's Iron Man, which is technology plus also weapons and the you know the military industrial complex. You have the literal embodiment of nuclear power nuclear weapons in the Hulk. You have the vision, which is an AI construct. You have the reformed Soviet Union in the Black Widow, right? And, and also you have Hawkeye shooting some arrows every now and then. But, and you have S.H.I.E.L.D., which is intelligence communities. What are they taking on, right? They're taking on evil, ancient evil, Loki, which is the same as the trickster, right? The devil. You've also got uh, Ultron, which is Oh my God, Ultron comes along just as we're afraid of bots and people being able to create programs and internet warfare. All of a sudden you have Thanos, who is the embodiment of climate change. They are literally fairy tales and mythologies about how the old order will protect us. And if we just pay patronage and if we just believe in them. And the reason why people are so drawn to them 
is because things like Christianity are starting to dwindle in terms of like the number of people going to churches, the number of people who are engaged in community groups. What we're being fed is this idea that through consumerism and through consuming, we'll still have the old powers to protect us. We'll still have these ideas that will go ahead and give us meaning and give us purpose, but we don't have to even go to church. We can just fire up Netflix. We don't have to go out and fight for democracy. You stream. And it is, it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy them. They're wonderful spectacles. I'm sorry, but in-game is just a fantastic spectacle. And like, I left and I was just like, I saw something amazing, you know, like it makes you, it does make you feel because it's incredible propaganda. And, and by the way, when I talk about this stuff, I bum people out. And I'm so sorry about that. And and I, I I can shut off my brain and I can watch stuff and I can enjoy it, I promise. But we also do need to understand what these stories do and what's happening with them. It's it's when we consume mindlessly, that's when the problems occur, right? When we just sort of take it as sort of our, our experience and we don't interrogate it, we don't really think about it. But we do have to find a middle ground between consuming the things that we enjoy. Because I'm like you, I when I'm when I'm cooling down or I need to turn my brain off. Like I I love entertainment as much as anybody, and I can turn my brain off. But also I can I can sit there and do that, and I can understand these are how these power structures continue and how they proliferate and how they uh, sort of protect themselves. So yeah, when I take a look at that stuff, I have to give it a critical eye. But also yeah, I I, I wish there was another end game coming up. I got to be honest with you. Jared, thank you so much for speaking to me on The Sacred. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Well, Jared is going on my tally of um, men having midlife spiritual awakenings, uh, metaphysical, um, not quite midlife crises, I'd say. They're more the opposite of that. But uh, it feels like everyone I speak to at the moment... Uh, between the ages of sort of 30 and 60, very especially men, um, many of them, you know, who would not self-describe as religious, uh, are, are really coming around to this sense that the spiritual element of life is more important um, and that it's possible that religion still has um, a huge amount to teach us, which I am intrigued by. I talked to a friend of mine recently who is a um, an academic, an academic in kind of uh, experimental psychology, evolutionary psychology of religion, and said, "How you know? How would I, how would I measure my hunch and see if I'm, you know, making the plurable of anecdote into data?" Um, and it's tricky. It's tricky. So at the moment, it's just a hunch, and we'll see uh, if it ever becomes measurable. Anyway, uh, Jared was. One of the people that I was um, a bit more nervous about interviewing, um, just stylistically, really, there's a real gap, I think, between British political commentators and American political commentators. And uh, American radio shows and podcasts with political commentators are very forceful. <laughs> you know, they're very sure of everything and um everything is underlined and in italics right there's very little light and shade and from um uh, my impression of jared i've obviously read a lot of his stuff but my, my public impression of jared was was more in that box than he in fact turned out to be as is almost always the case with my guests the impression that i have of them in my head um is very much complexified when I don't, um, when I get in a room or in a Zoom room with them and I immediately realise that uh, Jared is a lot more thoughtful and complex and self-aware and humble actually than um, his kind of public political persona um, sometimes suggests. Uh, I'm sure he won't mind me saying that. <laughs> it's it, uh, uh it took me on the journey that I often go on with this podcast of moving from uh, expectations and prejudices about someone um, to an encounter with a real person. And now I'm not going to tell you every time that happens. Uh, it happens a lot. Um, but I like to, you know, maintain the illusion 
that. I like everyone and I'm completely open-minded and have no prejudices or allergies. Um, but it's clearly not in fact true. And actually it was it was a lovely thing um, to be able to really um, connect with Jared on that human level. And his story and his telling of it reminds me how careful we have to be about um, listening to where people are coming from. And particularly those who have... Um, who carry pain, who carry scars from their childhood. I'm a person of faith and I am as tempted to tribalism as the next person and, you know, want to um, defend my team. Um, But uh, listening deeply to where someone is coming from and acknowledging where they've been hurt um, is a sort of prerequisite, really, for being able to have an honest human conversation. Um... And a lot of people who have rejected a kind of childhood, and it it happens also with politics and philosophies and um, any kind of quite intense ideological childhood, often later in life, I think people are able to realise there's a broader spectrum around that idea or that they actually received a lot of gifts from that childhood. But um, unless they feel safe and listened to and respected and their pain acknowledged... It's very difficult to get there. Um, So I was reminded about that. And we talked, obviously, on very sacred themes about what it takes to see each other uh, as fully human when we disagree, what it takes to to be good brokers, to be in a good faith conversation, to resist that fight or flight in us that causes us to shut down and withdraw from each other and... I remember starting the sacred and um, various members of my team at the time understandably thought it sounded a bit fluffy (laughs) and that, um, you know, why are you talking about talking was one of uh, of the comments. You know, when when people are very interested in politics or very interested in policy or in um, working in charity or business, something as kind of meta as this, something as reflected of this does sound... Can, can sound like a waste of time, right? Can sound like a talking shop. You're not building anything. You're not fixing problems directly. You're not feeding anyone. Um, but I'm more and more convinced that actually it's these it's the skills that I'm seeking to learn and hold open some space for that we really need in order to protect democracy, in order to protect a common life, in order to be able to live in any way in which we flourish um, alongside our neighbours um, and build a society marked by the common good. These habits are really difficult. Um, And as you've heard, (laughs) I'm still practicing them. Um, But uh, I was reminded just how important they are, even though they're hard to describe and they sound fluffy and soft. Um, These habits of the heart, as Parker Palmer calls them, who's a kind of Quaker activist, theorist of democracy, these habits of the heart, of a turning towards rather than away from each other, of bearing with each other, of listening, of seeking to understand, of kind of putting the best interpretation on something rather than the worst, that these are the habits by which we will stand or fall. Um, And finally, Marvel movies, which... uh, I really enjoyed talking about the. I went away and did some reading after I had come across Jared's position on this. And something he didn't mention is there's quite a strong financial link between the Pentagon and Marvel movies because they're basically impossible to make without some military input f- around the weapons, I think, <laughs> and the, uh, the scale of some of the filming. And so very often the Pentagon uh, collaborates on Marvel films and possibly other action films, I'm not sure, but won't sign off on that if the script is um, unnecessarily negative about the military. Which is a whole new thing to think about when I'm trying to relax and watch uh, Captain America. And I hope you'll think about it too, but maybe still enjoy it. That's all from me for this episode of The Sacred with Jared Yates Sexton. You have been listening to The Sacred Podcast. I hope you've picked that by now. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield. We have been going since 2017, so there are many, many back episodes for you to go and listen to. As always, we hugely appreciate it when you rate us. We haven't had a review in a while. I do love a review. If anyone fancies brightening my day and just leaving a little review, um, obviously a nice one is more likely to brighten my day. Uh, That would be great. Uh, No pressure. 
And I should say thank you to our team who are Daniel Turner and Lizzie Harvey. Our music is by Luke Stanley with vocals by Lizzie Harvey and The Sacred is a project of the Think Tank Theos. You can find out more at theosthinktank.co.uk. Thank you.